Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And as always, I am so excited about today's show. We're going to meet somebody I've been waiting well over a year to have on. And finally, he's here. I have manifested Captain Randy Kramer. A little bit later, he'll be with us. Life-changing psychic encounter, finding himself inside of a starship, and way more. What a life he's led. And today, he's beginning a university already on its feet, teaching some pretty fascinating stuff that we're going to get into. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. So if you would like to take a class, if you would like to become a facilitator globally, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. This show, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. It won the Best Radio and Podcast Show Award from the Coalition of Visionary Resources. And the show is listed right now in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. So thanks for getting that message and joining us. I'm so grateful you're here. Thanks for all your comments. I read them all and I get back to most of you. I think I do a pretty good job. Just know I appreciate you so much being on this journey. I am Debbie Dashinger. I do media visibility out into the world. And what does that mean? It's a three legged system that I run. The first piece is I coach authors to write a highly engaging page turner book. If you want to write a book, you can join our group at debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. We meet twice a month anywhere in the world on zoom. The second leg is I take your book to a guaranteed international bestselling status. I do all the heavy lifting and the bonuses that come with it are out of this world, guaranteed results. And the last and final leg is the ultimate visibility formula. I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you'd like a free gift to learn how you can become more visible and get some templates on how to do so, go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift my gift to you. So this episode features Captain Randy Kramer, who served more than 30 years for the US MCSS, the Covert Military Space Program branch of the US Marine Corps. Randy was the first Covert Space Program soldier to come forward more than a decade ago. He spent most of the last decade educating the public on covert space program affairs and current policies. He is a brave soul indeed. And right now he works with his partner, Kendra, building the University of Conscious Evolution from the huge success of the beta run of their courses last year. And the goal of UCE is to teach the easiest, most straightforward scientific techniques for meditation and psionic self-mastery to the world. They provide support to give students the maximum opportunity to learn while applying the skills of self-mastery. If you'd like to learn more, go to universityofconsciousevolution.com. And with that, I welcome Randy Kramer to Dare to Dream. It is great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Yep. Finally, finally. So I want to start because I love this idea of meditation and we'll dive into it a little later too. But I understand that by the age of 10, you were meditating. What caused such a young boy, probably at a time when that wasn't very popular, to start getting into meditation? Um, strangely enough, I had a, a, a weird best friend uh, and I was a little weird as a junior high kid myself. I wasn't, I mean, I we were smart and smart kids can be a little weird about that age. And so um, he managed to uh, find this book, which was probably about that thin, uh, that was something, some teeny little book that was probably printed out in late 1960s. That was about you and your psychic powers. And it was literally in the library of our, of our middle school uh, library. He pulled it out and he was just like, dude, look at what I found. And I was just like, okay. And we just started flipping around and kind of goofing around with some of the stuff that was in there. And um, I mean, I, so basically I, I, I probably, 
it probably was by the time I was 12 uh, that I started, that I picked up like my first book on like meditation out of the public library in town, which was had a bigger selection of some sort of weird, interesting stuff for a kid my age back in, you know, circa 1982 or whatever. Um, and it, it just flowed kind of naturally. And it just, there always seemed to be, and I'm sure this comes from training that I had as a kid that I didn't fully remember, mm. where I just knew there was more if I just kept going, you know, like, oh, this is something if I can master my brain and strengthen my brain muscles, I can do some stuff with it. And there, so it was just a real, like, in your bones feeling of that, even though I didn't necessarily have a reality uh outside of me around me that you know was reinforcing that or anything um so it really was just uh my best friend who found this crazy book in the library and so what kind and, of meditation and, did you start doing what was that like um i think the first book i picked up was on zen meditation uh which is the simplest really practice of meditation as far as technique uh because there's not much to it uh you sit real still and you try to empty your thoughts and be one with the void hmm. which is not a lot of instruction uh to be honest with you but what i found over the years is that there's kind of a disconnect between what meditation teachers want to teach people and how they're teaching it to them and i think the disconnect is that how they're teaching it to them is in a very 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 old way uh, which is a little more right brain, which is not exactly how we work in a modern society. We have computers and machines and cars. Our left brains are a lot more active uh, at this point in our evolution than they were 200 years ago, 300 years ago, uh, because of all the things that our left brain has to be able to keep track of um, in a way that you didn't necessarily have to 200 years ago or even 100 years ago. So, um, the te technology makes a huge difference on what's happening with the brains. And I don't think that there's a lot of good communication uh, about what to the left brain about what's happening. And mm -hmm. there turns out to be some dogma in some of the traditional schools uh, mm -hmm. when you start. Oh, yeah. Like some of the traditional schools of, you know, Tibetan Buddhist meditation uh, and some Vedic schools, you start talking about brainwave science and brainwave mastery and brainwave techniques and they'll go oh no you got to be more spiritual and I always I just think that's putting the cart before the horse trying to tell people that you have to be spiritual in order to be able to meditate I don't think that's true I think self-mastery the act of learning who you are getting into your own connected subconscious can make you become a better person if you do it right because you have to deal with all of the things that's inside your subconscious which is all the good bad and ugly of who we are as human beings and when you sort that stuff out to want to master your mind's ability to do things you have to sort out the garbage down there at some point it's just what has to happen and usually maybe not always but usually that is an act that will make a person a better, more centered, more grounded person. Well, isn't that what a more spiritual person is? A more centered, grounded person? So I don't think saying, telling people you have to be spiritual or pick some kind of spiritual path in order to learn to meditate is very kind uh, to people or going to get people to really learn how to meditate if you tell them you have to do all of these precursor things that you don't really have to do. So the science of meditation says you don't have to do any of those things uh in order to get people to somehow do something that's good for them why would you want to make so many obstacles to something that's good for people that's just healthy for people's brains their bodies their emotional states why would you want to inhibit people from access to that why would you want to make it hard why would you want to make their hurdles that make it more difficult why wouldn't you want everybody to understand that no matter what you believe, no matter where you're at in life, no matter how old you are, no matter how smart you are or not smart you are, you can learn the basics of what meditation is and how to strengthen your mind and your brain through the act of meditating on a regular basis. Yeah. And the main thing there is regularity. Teaching meditation is easy. You want to build the strength of your mind muscles. That takes daily regularity. And that's one of the most difficult things for people to keep up with and why we encourage students to have a program and have a schedule and you know we track things out over time so that there's 
you're building habits and patterns out of something because it's one of the hardest things I think for people to do is to develop a healthy pattern around meditating. But I don't know why people want to make it hard. So the whole goal here from my own, my lifetime of experience of reading every book, going to every class, uh, learning every technique that I ever could, and just kind of coming to the conclusion that, okay, I get what's happening here. I get what people are trying to do on a very broken down level. There's a lot of like, we're trying to do A to accomplish B to get to C, but there's just a lot of talk, a lot of words and a lot of dogma around that. And a lot of, we well, have to do this or do this. When brainwave science comes along, brainwave meditation comes along, uh, thanks to a gentleman by the name of Maxwell Cade and a former mentor of mine named Anna Weiss, who both passed away, who started this work back in the 70s, uh, essentially developing an EEG that checks out what your brain waves are doing in different states of activity, uh, meditative consciousness, and so forth, and found that there were ideal brainwave patterns that occur uh, when a person meditates, when a mathematician, a genius mathematician is working a problem, when a concert violinist is playing, you know, in their zone, when people are in their zone, these ideal or awakened brainwave patterns occur again and again and again and again, telling us that what's happening in your mind when we're doing anything inside your brain, that your mind is inside your brain, what's happening there is really about brainwave states. And once that was understood that it was about brainwave states, we could really just dump all this other crap that we don't need and just say, okay, this is about brainwave states. This is about going from beta states to alpha states to state theta states without dropping into delta states, period. And there's a simple way to teach that. There's simple ways to teach all of the things that work around that. And you can we build and stack on top of that, but the basics, basics, basics of what meditation is and how to do it, it's not rocket surgery. A 12-year-old can do it. A 12-year-old can do it. And it's, guys, I could do it when I was 12. I, a 12-year-old can do it. It's not hard. Yeah. You just have to break it down into the easy parts. So here you are, you're a kid, you're, you're smart, you're a nerd, and you're also finding this resonance with things, psychic, yeah. meditation, and so forth. And then somewhere along your timeline of life, you suddenly start having these memory disturbances. Can you talk about that? And also, what was the recall at that time? What starts happening? So the that process, if I'm to look back at it from here all the way back, there were things that popped up from the time that I was a kid, but they were isolated instances, which I had no context for, and therefore my brain couldn't do anything other than just go mm, with that. Um, in hindsight, looking from a future place, I could look back and go, okay, there was probably something going on there. That was probably telling me something. So there were little hints uh, that my own subconscious was trying to drop to me uh, the whole time, things that was trying to let me know, uh, things that would come up in recur recurring dreams and things that I had no context for, but again, made sense later. Um, so, but when, but I would say that and almost immediately from the time of the return of my tour of duty, which was 17 years old, there were vivid flashes of things that would, you know, I could be in a waking moment sitting at the breakfast table in my car driving and just have the most vivid picture pop into my brain of something that was usually horrific, usually bloody bodies, you know, scattered across the ground and so forth. Uh, that kind of fun stuff. Uh, sarcastic, not fun at all. Uh, and I was, I was finding myself just being very shocked when that would happen and going, wow, where's that coming from? And I'm, I'm not sure what to do with that. And, but the more that I continued to meditate as a per, as an individual, uh, and the closer I would get to these places in my brain, I would hit these areas, which were at, at the same time horrifying and terrifying and at the same time completely like drawing me to them and repulsing me from them at the same time so then i could tell that there were these 
compartments of experience that were happening inside mine because I was getting pretty familiar at what it was like to swim around in the subconscious at that point, which is also what you're really doing when you're meditating over time. You're just taking little dives and swimming around in your subconscious and there's all kinds of stuff. So I was getting pretty familiar with what memory packets felt like, what a memory area felt like. And I was like, okay, these are isolated packets of memory that I want to look at, but I can't look at. And they just are absolutely horrifying and terrifying to even think about it. And I mean like adrenaline response, like, you know, the, the, the feeling of it is just like heart pumping adrenaline wanting to pop right out of your chest from, you know, the intense, intense adrenaline response of something that's just overwhelmingly horrifying or terrifying. Um, so at some point in that process, um, you know, I, I knew there was just something probably going on. And, and, and I started just at, you know, kind of putting myself on the track of like, okay, either I'm completely fucking nuts mm -hmm. or I have a case of post-traumatic stress disorder that's weird and, and I need to address that. And the closer and closer I got and the farther along I got, it was really easier and easier to eliminate insanity, you know, as one of the list of options. Um, I had this really great friend who was a psychiatrist uh, who passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease a number of years ago, unfortunately. Um, and I was chatting with him and I was saying, look, I, 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 I have some issues. I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure, um, like what's going on. I, I, I either have some weird post-traumatic stuff that I'm not sure what to do with or you know, something else is really wrong with my brain, given the stuff that's happening. And he was nice enough to say, well, all right, let's look it up. And at the time, the book was the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual number four or the DSM four. And so we popped it out and we started flipping through it. And we went through all of the symptomology for all of the disorders. And I just didn't check boxes. I just didn't check enough boxes at all for the disorders and checked like 17 out of 18 boxes on post-traumatic stress disorder. So I was like, I was nice enough to have a friend who was a psychiatric doctor who was like, well, let's look at your diagnosis and, you know, go, okay, no, you're not crazy. You, you check almost all the boxes for post-traumatic stress disorder here. I know a therapist, maybe you should talk to her. And so uh, who was a person who had worked with experiencers and worked with abductees. So I was able to sit with someone who wasn't going to go, that sounds crazy. Um, and just started getting memories back at that point. And once Can you it give started, us a I glimpse? Like, Can you give us just some kind of glimpse into some of the reference points of things that you started to recall and know you had been through? Um, various scenes and various planets people all of that sure I, I mean the 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 first and foremost thing is just like i said snapshots or what i would call short video snips of just horrible battle violence just horrible battle violence that was most of it at first um and then it was just out of context places that i don't remember ever being in a chronological way doing things that made no sense, using tools that made no sense because they seemed, excuse me, way too technologically advanced to be available of usage. Um, anything that had alien life or, or any sort of xenobiology, you know, I, I was just putting into the categories of like, wow, I have weird nightmares. Um, but I knew that that wasn't the case. I, I, you know, the closer I got in, the more I just knew it was something more than that. I didn't want it to be that. There was a part of me that was just like, please don't be, please don't be aliens, please don't be aliens, please don't be aliens, please don't be aliens, please. I was really like really holding, crossing my fingers and going, please don't be aliens. And did you um, know, did you yeah. have any sense working with this person as these scenes are coming up in these memories that are so visceral, did you think at any point or the person you're working with, these are past future parallel lives going on that you're recalling? Was that ever on the table? Um, it was it was on the table up until there was a, a moment of recollection that was so emotionally visceral. And I, I'd done past life work, you know, before back in my 20s, started that in my early 20s. So, I, you know, I knew the difference between feeling something that's still visceral from a past life versus something that happened in the 
this life, which is way more visceral. So there was a moment where it was just like, oh no, that's way too intense and way too visceral to be anything other than something that happened to me personally. And at that point, the chronology was starting to take shape. I was like, okay, I kind of remember something that happened at this point and then later and then here and here. So it was coming in chunks that started to paint a, a timeline that started to make sense. Again, I didn't like it. I didn't want it. I was like, oh, please no, not that. But it was starting to make sense. And so by that time, I was, I was able to at least go, well, okay, lo logically, th this is where the compass is pointing. This is where the path, the breadcrumbs are leading. I don't want that to be the case. I really hope that's not the case, but let's keep going and get all the information so we know for sure. But I, it was starting to look pretty apparent at what was going to And what is it that you came to know? What is it that you came to understand about who you are, your life, your life previous to all this memory disruption? What did you piece together? Oh, uh, that I'd spent, you know, decades uh, serving as a soldier for United States Marine Corps Special Section and the Earth Defense Force, which is covert military space program, military operations for global earth and solar defense. Um, yeah, and, and that that involved an entire childhood of training, augmentation, you know, up until my adult life career, and then being sent back to live my life, whatever bullshit they want to call it back at 17 years old to do it over again, but down here and then, you know, just sort of have to come to this realization that my life is a lie, um, you know, or that everything that I thought was what my waking life was, was just like, oh, this is not everything at all. So it was a shock in some ways. I mean, I was prepared because of the, the trail of events. But at the same time, there was a moment where I was just like, oh, no, this is my life. Oh, shit. And and I was just very shocked to, to just kind of have to try and absorb all of that. But it was that was after enough chunks of memory that really made it very, very clear of what was going on and what had happened that I could I could finally go, well, all right, I can't. There's no way I can deny this no matter how to argue. Were your parents aware? Did you did your parents know at all what nope. about your training? No, no, not at all. No, no, it's it's a completely covert experience as far as they come into your room at night, take the kids out, bring them back later. They can, we call it trace amounts of time travel are used so that you return someone a few minutes after they left so that it doesn't seem like they ever went using yeah. wormhole jump gate technology to get in and out of places. And when I was super, super young, back in the early 70s, before they had the jump gate technology, they would actually drive around in white vans and put everybody to sleep with a Delta emitter, walk into the house, come pick you up, take you back to the van, the van would take you to a shuttle, the shuttle would take you. It was, it was way more- That's crazy. Intensive. It sounds a little bit like that TV show Squid Game, if you saw it on Netflix. I have not. It, I heard it was good, a, I have not seen it. It's different. Of course, they take them in a white, they put them to sleep, take them in sure. a white van, but they take them to an island to play this uh, murderous game, but kind of the same. You went to another planet and- so are are today are you still in the marine corps are you still called? oh yeah no i'm active duty officer for united states marine corps special section i'm the official public relations officer and spokesperson for the command staff of the united states marine corps special section beautiful and so I, what i want also to establish here is it is a federal offense for you in your position to lie right a list of them yeah, impersonating an officer is a felony. Uh, lying about duty stations, medals, award certificates is a felony. Defrauding the public, which is, you know, making claims and, you know, having people pay me any money for a consultation or a class would be considered committing, using that to commit fraud. Oh, no, there's a list of felonies uh, that it would be if that were true. So uh, when and you're I speaking, said, you are you are speaking the truth your truth oh yeah i well here's what let me finish what i have said many many times over the years i have told any person i say look you think i'm committing fraud here's what you do pick mm -hmm. up the phone you call the fbi and you report my ass um and so i've encouraged anybody who thinks i'm committing fraud feel free call me call them up report me go ahead and i would love for them to pick up the phone and call me and talk to me haven't heard from them no so <laughs> no, and, and if and if 
And if, if that were true, if I, if they, people have made complaints and I know they have, I know they have, uh, and the FBI were to investigate that and conclude that I was in fact committing fraud, I would have gotten a letter by now. My lawyers have said I would get a cease and a, a letter that says that I have to show proof for cease and desist, mm -hmm. which then my attorney writes the letter back and says, great, we'd love a hearing. We'd love to show proof, but we, we want a hearing. And then they go, oh, we don't want to give you a hearing. So that's why that process is never going to happen because mm -hmm. no, they don't want me to have a hearing. They would rather just have plausible deniability and then just go, oh, that guy, whatever. And then we'll get right on that. And then I, but if, if I were committing crimes, I've been doing this for over 10 years. I would have heard from now. I would have gotten a letter, would have gotten a phone call, something, and I have not. So yeah, you've been on TV. I that's I've seen yeah. your interview. So yeah. I know you've been around magazines, many shows. I and yeah. so you talked about a life you would live to a certain point and then go back and live. And what would that establish for you today? What age are you in 3D right now? And what age are you actually? This body what I'm touching right here isn't my original. It's not the first one. It's uh, probably the, I don't know, somewhere around, you know, the 15th or 20th or 30th, you know, shell that they've given me because we burn them up and blow them up and explode them a lot. So they give you new ones and transfer your consciousness and whatever. So this is not my first body. This body is um, 52. Uh, I, my chronological age, the chronological memory of age that I have from birth to this moment right now is 96 years. So there's a tour time, there's a training period time that all adds up to that, but it's 96 years. And why did you bridge the gap from being in the Marine Corps and all your experiences to now establishing an online university? How did that come about? Um, my Brigadier General and I have had many discussions uh, about what kind of things that I should talk about that are helpful to talk about. We have just, I mean, he doesn't tell me what to say. We just have conversations about it. And um, many years ago, um, he asked me, well, what do you think is the most important thing that people need to learn or know? And I was like, psionics. And he was like, okay, teach that. And I was like, what? And he was like, no, nah, you know, like teach a class from the manual or something. Go ahead. And I was like, what? Um, I was I was honestly shocked that it was his response. He was just like, yeah, teach a class, get some civilians together. Good. And so I started teaching um, in-person classes like, you know, where it was me and a bunch of students in the room teaching uh, the psionics course. And I'd done that a bunch of times. Uh, and then COVID happened. And so that was not going to happen for a minute. And I was like, well, someone really was just like, dude, you do an online course. And I was like, okay. And so it really just turned into an online course out of, you know, sort of necessity of the inability to do in-person classes that was going to be for a minute and do them online. Yeah. And so it really was a journey of just like, people need to know psionics. People need to understand this stuff. My, what my experience has been talking to mm -hmm. people even experienced meditators, people who have some kind of a practice is when people have problems, they're having issues, they're having hurdles or blocks or obstacles, more than anything, my answers are always basics and fundamentals, basics and fundamentals, basics and fundamentals, basics and fundamentals. So I feel like there's a real lack of basics and fundamentals here. I love it. And I just want folks, in case they don't know what psionics means, it's the practical use of psychic powers or paranormal phenomena, such as psionic communication. So if that is so, then Randy, what for you is psionic development? Oh, so the very, very act of daily meditation uh, does something to your brain and to your mind that I do this little muscle building gesture. It is literally like curls for your brain. It's curls for your mind. And the more that you do it, and there are also developmental skill uh, disciplines, if you will, for certain specific abilities, uh, like precognition, uh, dowsing, remote viewing, telekinesis, which are the four that I teach in the advanced course. Um, 
that are like double weights when you do those exercises, when you work those disciplines, but just the act of meditating every day and doing a practice is like curls for your brain and for your mind. And so what it does over time, again, this is consistency. Uh, it will make you smarter. Uh, it will make your ability to perceive spatial mathematics, spatial geometry increase. Um, it will increase the speed at which your brain can process information. It will increase the ability for your conscious brain to communicate with your subconscious brain, which is where all the stuff is in your subconscious brain. So the act of the mind communicating with the conscious and the subconscious brain, that's really where self-mastery comes in. Because when, so let's just say your conscious brain, we're just going to be general about anybody and everybody. And we're going to say, let's say your IQ is 120, which is above average, 100 is average. Um, this is a little sad fact for people who don't know this. 100 is average, means half the population is under 100, scary, and the other half is over 100, right? Also kind of scary. So, but let's just say, because everyone listening to you is above average, that you have a 120 IQ. That's in your conscious brain. Your subconscious brain has an IQ that is several hundred points higher than your conscious brain. So the very act of connecting your conscious and subconscious brains doesn't just make you like smarter. It makes your brain capacity bigger. It makes the capacity for what your mind can do at any given moment bigger. These are things that are what really drive personal human evolution is the mind, is development of the mind and the brain. And it is these tools and skills that you do these little curls with. And then eventually, which depending on the person and the practice, level of experience, age, you start to see manifestation of psionic ability. That just starts to happen. Just starts to happen because you're building the muscles that can make the outputs happen now. I know you've said that with psionic said every thought, every fear, every anxiety is what exactly? Energy. Uh, psionic uh, is psionic energy, psionic outputs. Every thought, first law of psionics is that every thought produce all thought produces psionic energy. Mm -hmm. So, which we uh, in the lab, uh, when we're registering and dealing with psionics, we register them in si something called psions per second, which is a form of work for anybody who's physics people out there. So it's, you know, force over time. Um, so, but we call it science per second. And there's kind of this threshold for most abilities to happen where you have to be above 10, 15, 20 science per second for them to occur. So let's just say this is a threshold of 15 science per second. Most people, you know, are they're going up and down all the time. And maybe you get over that thing for a moment and something happens, you go, oh, I did something. And but then you just kind of drop right back into sort of a 13 or a 12 scions per second. And then you think, oh, I can't do it anymore. Of course you can do it. It's just about getting those outputs so that they're over threshold. And it is that daily practice, daily diligence that builds the brain muscle, builds the mind muscle so that those scions per second, you break the thresholds and then just stuff just starts to happen. And what about using psionic, psionics for self-defense or for attacks? How would one do that? Um, we have a section on psionic self-defense. Uh, certainly there are ways in which, many ways, in which a person creates shielding around themselves and can mm, maybe do tricky things like affect probability around themselves I as like a form that. of defense. So there's lots of little tricks uh, that you can do other than just basic shielding. Um, I do not teach my students psionic attack because they can be very dangerous and I'm not going to teach people how to do that, but I will tell, tell you this, anyone who wants to do the curriculum and go through the beginning course and go through the advanced course, they'll figure it out. If that's what they want to learn how to do, you'll figure it out. Yeah. I know you also talk about dream walking. Oh yeah. It's have one of my have you successfully yourself dream walked and if so can you talk us through the experience or experiences 
Oh, that's one of my best skills. Mm. Yeah, dreamwalking turns out to be one of my best skills. So uh, dreamwalking is really just the ability to decide uh, whose dream you want to walk in. So I can walk right out of mine and walk right into somebody else's and then just wander around, see what's going on. Or maybe get up to some shenanigans, but you know, I don't want to tell too many stories, uh, but yeah. When, Is once it a, you're in so it's a, for you, it's space, a very can... lucid experience. You're completely aware and you oh, yeah. can uh, direct and control where you're going, what's going to happen or what you're not going to do. You know, I, I understand you take a lot of caution. To a degree, yeah, to a degree. I mean, you're really at that point kind of wrestling with the psionic output of the mind of the person. So a weak-minded person is easy to go in and like just make them dream whatever you want to make them dream um, or do whatever. But someone with a stronger mind can be much more difficult to penetrate and difficult to get around there and do stuff. They might put up a fight, you might kick your ass, it might kick you right back out. Hmm. So as an accomplished dream walker, if someone tried to walk into one of my dreams, I would kick their ass and kick them right back out. I'd be like, no, nah, not my dreams. Not um, but so someone who is really tough could do that, kick me out of their dreams. But I, I try not to be mean and obtrusive, you know, if I'm checking stuff out. It's more, I try to keep it to intel gathering for the most part. Interesting. Fascinating. Because it's all down there. Everybody's thoughts are down in the subconscious. You want to do intel gathering on someone. I'm telling you, there's nothing like walking through a dream to figure out what's going on. I got to ask you, so because that's like beyond remote viewing, does the government use this dream walking? Uh, there are some psionic specialists who are skilled at it. Yeah. I mean, I learned it through a government program. So mm. okay. yeah, military program. Got it. Well, if I see you, <laughs> no, no, no. Make no, it no. good. <laughs> I, I, no, no. I will not promise. I will not be coming to your dreams. I promise. Okay. Deal. Can you share usable tips? Self healing, self mastery. Can you tell the audience some usable tips that they can incorporate for self healing and self mastery? Um. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that there's there's steps that that have. If I were teaching a student that there are some steps that I would probably say you're going to start here you're going to go there and so forth but we'll skip steps for a second and I'll just throw out some info okay. um so the have you have you happened to uh, seen the water crystal books uh by Dr. Emoto absolutely yes okay okay absolutely. most I, a lot of people have by now but they've been around it's been a while so sometimes when i mention them, not everybody knows. okay so we know scientifically through double and triple bind studies from dr emoto's work that the mind has the ability to change the shape of water crystals right so we know that on a very tiny tiny level the brain the mind has the ability to affect matter especially water for some reason and there's some reasons that I can explain about that is because it's soft, right? That has a lot to do with it. Water's soft uh, molecularly. So the ability to move it, shift it, and change it is easier than trying to move or shift a piece of lead. But to be honest, moving the subatomic molecules in a piece of lead and in water are the same. This one's just a lot harder. These are molecules are stuck together. They're way more viscous. They're way more solid and making the move is going to be more difficult. But in something like water, which is already a fluid, is much easier. So we know that that's a thing, right? So your body is mostly water, right? So uh, talking to your body's water to tell, because your cells are water. Right? You're not just talking to the water around your cells, you're talking to the water that's in your cells. So you're talking to everything at that point. So talking to the water in your body is a way of communicating to all the cells in your body in a way that they really listen. Okay. Now I'm going to throw in uh, an extra additive for that one. So when people talk about their DNA and wanting to change their DNA through a meditative act or through metaphysical practice of some kind. Most people don't know how to do that. And most of the practices that people are doing to do that are probably not going to work. But I can give you this much of a tip. The way to understand how to change your own genetics is to understand that DNA is fluids 
of different and varying viscosities. And being that they are fluids of varying and different viscosities, not solid matter, they are not solid matter. Your DNA is not solid, it's a liquid. It's a liquid. DNA is liquid, but not a flowing liquid like water is. It's a, it's a, it's a stable liquid, right? The TGACs are a stable liquid of biological material. So it's fluids of different and varying viscosities. So once you understand how you can move water and change water and affect water in your body, it's just one more that'll skip to genetics because your genetics are also water of varying and different viscosities. There you go. There's a freebie. Amazing tip, by the way. Um, oh, okay. I know there's some people that can do something with that. So you are. Yeah. Okay. And you teach this also in the course? I, uh, the beginning course, I, I don't think this is a topic I've covered or that we're covering in the beginning course, the advanced course. Uh, absolutely. It's like the wizard course, And I'll just course, make a huh? quick distin distinction here. Yeah. Uh, the beginning course is what we feel are the essential tools to start with, right? So it's basic meditation. It's a general uh, understanding of what you're we don't call them chakras, we call them psionic foci, what your psionic foci are doing, how they operate, what is important about them and balancing them in your meditative acts. Psionic self-defense, uh, manifesting, and a few other fun stuff. The advanced course is advanced um, and we cover Merkaba training, some more complicated things about field programming, uh, how different ways in which your mental, emotional, psionic personality affect development and how you have to sort of understand those things is kind of a tripod of development, as well as actual practical, well, more advanced psionic self-defense than what we're going to teach in the basic course. The beginning course has basic psionic self-defense, more advanced psionic self-defense for the advanced course. And then we cover uh, four disciplines for the development of four specific psionic skills. Uh, and that's dowsing skill, remote viewing skill, precognition skill, and telekinesis. Okay, amazing. So I teach students uh, how to build a TK trainer, telekinesis trainer, and what the basic technique for making a very tiny object in a near frictionless environment is. And I've had students replicate it. The, the only thing disappointing, I'm gonna admit, the only thing disappointing about teaching telekinesis in the online course is I'm not having 100% success with students that I did in the physical course. When mm -hmm. I taught this in person in a classroom where I could walk around with every person, every single person in the class could replicate the technique. I could wow. teach every single person in those classes how to do telekinesis on a very tiny object in a near frictionless environment. So maybe um, when, the, uh, when the university really takes off, you can start doing in-person retreats. We're talking about all kinds of things. And what I'm based on sort of how the beta went last year, I think what we're going to have to do is um, just have a, a clinic, kind of a clinic yeah. on it where we get students going to say, okay, let's really specifically work on, you know, what, what people aren't getting in order to make it move. And there's a mental block for most people. It's a mental block where you're sitting there going, oh, why can't I do this? It's because there's a part of you that's telling you that you can't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and, and anyway, there's a way in, in an in-person class, especially because of the demonstration. I can mm. talk about it, demonstrate the technique, show everybody that they could do it, and then just get each person to replicate the technique. And I'm only a little disappointed that I haven't hit 100% at being able to get students to replicate that technique in the online course, but some students have. So um, nobody else in the world is teaching you telekinesis. So take their course otherwise, if you want to, but if you want to move stuff with your mind, take our course. Cool. You also teach self-healing for emotional wounds, which is- Oh yeah, that's Kendra's powerful. course. Give us some examples. Have you used it on your life? Have you used it on people you've worked with who have healed traumas or wounds? How does that, what does that look like? How does that manifest? 
Um, that's actually kind of your question. Uh, the emotional healing course is her course, uh, and oh. it's really her baby. Can so you're kind of behind the question. camera somewhere. Yeah. Um, do you want to try to answer that question? Oh, sorry. she's like, <laughs> she no. didn't hear the question. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, go ahead. Can you repeat the question real quick here? Yes, absolutely. I understand that you also teach self-healing. I'm speaking loud like she's a million miles away. That's okay. I understand she's you teach. Right it's just a brief question. Hey, Kim, <laughs> nice to finally meet you. you. You teach self-healing for emotional wounds. I'm asking for examples yeah. from your lives, if you've healed any emotional wounds or people you've worked with or you teach who have healed traumas or wounds, emotional wounds. What does that look like? How does it manifest? What kind of technique? Oh, absolutely. It manifests on so many different levels because so many different people have just different levels of trauma in their life, you know? And if we have stagnant trauma from something minor from a, when we were little or something major, it, that'll manifest over time in a lot of different ways. So some of my great success stories are you know, women that were in abusive situations that came out and they're free and clear and making tons of money and supporting their families and stuff like that. So, and your university in general, like how long is the entire course or how long is each segment? How does that work? Um, that's a thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, so we've Again, learning lessons from the uh, beta run that we did last year. Uh, we're attempting to make this very navigable. So we've broken things, no, excuse me, into tiny bits so that uh, when you're going, when a student is going back and looking, okay, wait, wait, what was that part about on oh, the second foci? Instead of having to try and sift through a 20 minute lecture on the subject, the topic is broken up, the whole lecture is broken up into lots of little video segments so that it's very navigable um, and goes through a, a kind of what we consider the, here's where you should start and work this part and then this part and then this part and then go all the way forward. So I think we've got a little over 30, I think videos uh, for the basic course. We've calculated about 33 or 34 for the advanced course. And they're anywhere from a couple minutes to five or six minutes long, uh, or and the guided meditations, which are longer, obviously, than five or six minutes. The one I did the other day was about 20 minutes long for that one. So we've got the lecture series, uh, guided meditations, got it all broken down into here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four. I like to say meditations like riding a bicycle. You don't have to know how to build a bicycle to ride a bicycle. And so this is really a how-to course uh, more than anything. Um, so I cut down a lot of the blah, 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 blah that I did in the older course in order to just say, this is the simplest bit of information you need to get on the bicycle, start pedaling. Uh, and because it is the act of doing, uh, that will really get people to understand why it's important to do or why you should want to do it or why it's good for you. Like I can talk about it all day long and a person can sit there and go, oh, that's cool. Or go, oh, I don't know. Like your experience of it, you sit down, meditate for a month. And then if you come back and go, I haven't learned anything and I haven't developed at all. And I don't feel smarter or stronger in any way. I'm like, well, then maybe you're doing it wrong. But pretty much everyone else, if they do it consistently, will come back and go, wow, I feel better. This is happening in my life. I have, I have this much awareness about this. I'm less reactive to this. I don't get angry at my kids anymore. Like all these things start to happen and change. So it is the act of doing it that will convince people, this is why this is good for you. And you, it, I don't benefit from people learning to meditate. I, I just want them to learn how so that it benefits well, you yeah. do. I mean, you get a million karma points in your bank account every time you improve somebody's life. So sure, I, sure, sure. It's so worth it. And so I'm going to flip a little bit in our, our last segment here to more space kind of talk, if you will, oh, sure. or universal everything. Sure. Mandy, do you know of a specific ET advanced technologies that Earth humanity earth slash humanity would benefit from what kind of technology are you willing to disclose here well i mean we need all the technology to be honest with you um so i mean we can talk about 
I mean, medical technology, you know, I've discussed holographic medical bed technology before. There's no rush, uh, unfortunately, on that being developed at this point. We've spent wasted 10 years uh, talking to people with venture capital to try and do anything with it. And we're just not going to make the money that way to work the project. I think we're more likely to see these technologies come in during or post alien invasion, which is coming up. Um, and that's probably what's going to happen sooner than anything else. But in our medical lifetime, technology, what's that? In our lifetime. Oh yeah, super soon. We're at the World War Three phase. Alien invasion phase is next. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Let, let me go back a second. So in December of 2019, at the beginning of the pandemic, I okay. said, "Here's what's going to happen." You we are about it. to enter the pandemic. Oh, yeah, I nailed it. I, I researched and you it. said before it happened, it was going to happen. I said pandemic phase, civil disruption phase, World War Three phase, alien invasion phase. And we're, may I ask you, because down, the only one left. Yes, I have so many sources who talk about the contact that's about to happen very much in the time frame you're talking about, but they never use the word invasion. They're very clear to talk about the benevolent beings who've been watching after us and probably keeping us pretty much alive for a long time that will be making the contact. Are you saying something contrary to that? Uh, I'm saying that's wishful thinking. And if people want to have wishful thinking, they're welcome to it. But we understand that uh, there has been a planned process for this for some time which is really based around inevitabilities. And, and I, I realize there's some confusion when I talk about this and people think, oh, it's a false flag. It's a fake invasion, I'm sorry, fake alien invasion. No, this is a series of inevitabilities that are coming to a loggerhead and they are going to fight like hell for control and domination of the planet that we live on. Uh, this is mostly because Nazis are gonna Nazi. And we didn't get rid of them at the end of World War II. And they're coming back for another run at the Fourth Reich. And they're going to make sure that we get this whole thing brought in with an invading force and a disclosure event that is just going to be a Well, I'm in fight. trouble. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm yeah, Jewish. So it's going to be that's not mess. good news for me. Um, let me tell you this. Nazis aren't good news for anybody. Right. Uh, they're bad for everybody. Um, and let's just make that as clear as possible um and nazis bad nazis always bad um and this is a, a, a bunch of inevitable things that were happening for decades and we've watched these things come closer and closer and there's a collision point that we're in we're in that collision point and as all of these things come and collide in this collision point there are certain inevitabilities and I mean, I, look, as I will say as much as anybody else, I, I'd love for this to go nice and peaceful. Like, that'd be great. I, I'm not against that. I'm not saying I, I, I want and prefer there to be an invasion scenario. I'm saying that as near as we understand, this is not going to happen peacefully. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen peacefully. And I will also say this about our intergalactic neighbors and friends. Okay. They're wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And they are helping, mm -hmm. but this is not their home. This is not their planet. This is not their house. So they don't get to decide what's happening here. They don't get to tell us what to do. They don't get to decide who's going to do what. They don't get to, get to come down and tell us who's going to fight who or who's not going to fight who or who. They don't get to tell us how this is happening. We're deciding how this is happening. Terrans are deciding how this is happening. And fortunately or unfortunately, there are some Terrans who are Nazi assholes uh, that want to have it out. And the rest of us kind of feel like it's long overdue to finally have it out with them and say, okay, let's just finally, let's have it out once and for all and winner take all and the survivor will murder the rest of the other side so that it's not a problem anymore. And do you feel, Randy, on the ET human terrestrial affairs, that there is a future in store for us of a planet with open borders, with trade to the intergalactic community? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Post-invasion, we go into the, so when I do the stages, one, two, three, four, uh, pandemic stage, civil disruption phase, World War III phase, alien invasion phase, there's a fifth phase. 
Fifth phase is the reconstruction phase. The reconstruction phase is why we have to do all of this the other way. Because if we don't get to the reconstruction phase, we will not fix the problems and we're all gonna die. Not gonna be enough air to breathe, not gonna be enough water, all the forests are gonna burn up. We're all gonna die if we don't fix the problems. The environment will kill us all. Mother nature will kill us all in 10 years if we don't fix things. When you were um, on Mars at one point in one of your missions, you battled the reptilians. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been called out once <laughs> making a, a blanket statement about reptilians as though they're, you know, bad, the bad guys. And somebody said, no, you know, that race, there's good, bad, et cetera. Oh so, yeah. It's, spe it's speciesist. Exactly. It's, it, it's speciesism. Yeah. And were you, were you dealing with Martian reptilians and did you ever get to know any or did you just battle them? Oh um, yeah. The native indigenous reptoids uh, are real nice. Well, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. The ones that I got to meet and hang out with, we developed a trusting relationship, and I think they're real nice. Uh, but some of the other, they were pretty clear that some, especially the Southern tribes are pretty rough, and you're probably not going to make friends with them, and they're probably just going to eat you. Um, so they're, they're kind of, they can, they have kind of a rough culture uh, as far as what life and death means and whether you know, you get to come anywhere near their space and live because you crossed over a rock line. It's like, nah, you're going to die now because you came over that line um, versus whether they want to be nice or friendly. They're not, I mean, they're not like, um, they're not mean spirited uh, by any means uh, in my experience. They're, they're, they're quite kind hearted. They just have a very, very fierce attitude about boundaries. So they're pretty cool. Uh, the, Draconians did attempt an invasion while we were there. That's a whole story. Um, they're a different in reptoid species from somewhere very far away. They look real different. They act real different. They behave real different. I hate them very much and we killed them whenever possible. Uh, but that's, I mean, two completely different examples of a developed species that just happen to be reptiles. So yeah, it's speciesism to say that reptiles are bad. They're not. Right. We have an indigenous reptoid species here mm -hmm. on the planet, the subterranean. They're also what I would say kind hearted with pretty fierce boundaries, you know, so I wouldn't say that they're mean spirited or awful in any way, shape or form. But a lot of people might find them cold and impersonal. But I mean, I think that they're just they have a very specific way of doing things and they have agendas about bigger pictures and things and are concerned about the well-being of the planet for millennia to come yeah. and forth so and yeah. then there's the insectoid manta man wow these words insectoid manted civilizations yeah and so are these typically always the doctors the healers How, what was your experience with them no not at all um i mean i they they again insectoids have a very wide range of expression that they can find for their culture and for their species and for their civilization. Um, they can, I mean, um, let me try and put it this way. So I've met uh, more than one insectoid species that I would say, even when we say mantids, I don't think they look anything like a praying mantis. And I think culturally, socially, they're way more like ants hmm. than they are like Mantises. Mantises are a very solitary insect. These are collective hive insects. It's much more like ants or termites, but more like ants, to be honest with you, as far as they're sort of being productive um, and sort of industrious. So uh, to me, they're more like an evolution of, of an ant species. So an evolution of, let's say, a wasp species. Wasps are assholes, right? I mean, they're just assholes. So I, I've met you know, an, an advanced developed wasp species. They're assholes. They're just absolute assholes. Um, so that's a completely different, you know, expression, but they're also being evolved from two completely different kinds of insects. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, when you were in the, well, you still are, but 
uh, this portion of your life, the USMCSS, this covert unacknowledged special access program, it was signed into law as a legal and covert branch of the US military in 1953 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Correct. And he mandated a code to meet the exopolitical questions of extra terrestrial biological entities and extraterrestrial vehicles. And then I'm just wondering what it was like for you. Was it a full circle? Because I know that you were interviewed by his great granddaughter, who's been on this show before, Laura Eisenhower. What was that like for you? Um, I mean, there was a little like a kind of a weird circle-y thing there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing uh, because not just, I mean, not just my military career, but pretty much my very biological existence wouldn't exist if that hadn't happened. So in some very weird way, you know, I sort of have Dwight Eisenhower personally to thank for the fact that I'm even existing and I'm alive in any way, shape or form. Um, so that's a little weird, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's just inter- it, more interesting to me how one, person's decision can just impact so much later in life. I, I think of anything that makes me think that I should always be careful and thoughtful with my decisions because I never know when one is going to have a long lasting impact. Yeah, because you're not the only person, right? There are other men and women in your predicament. Go, oh, go lots. through the same thing. Yeah, lots. So I, yeah, definitely being able to talk about it over the years. If, if there's one thing that I feel probably the most, like I can pat myself on the back for, it's people who have come forward, who have had memory repression issues. We've been able to, there's a whole protocol that we have that we can help sort people out mm-hmm. and getting people back on track whose lives are just a dumpster fire because mm-hmm. of sort of the state that they're left in and being able to do some very specific known protocol techniques get into the brain and tinker with some stuff and get people back on track. That's incredibly satisfying feeling to know that I turn a person's life around by just being able to do it. Nope. Get this way. Go. Okay. And that's very satisfying for yeah. sure. Cause those people's lives are a mess. They're a mess. My life was a mess too, when I was in that state. So I understand what kind of a mess it's like to be in. And it's very satisfying to be able to help turn someone out of that mess and into something better and productive for themselves. My last space question for you is, what were the conditions like in space for you? What were the conditions like for you on Mars? Depends. Uh, Really, to be honest, as a military soldier, my rank and position had a lot to do with um, sort of the situation that I was in and the general sort of either stress, comfort, or lack of you know, it was present. So when I was a private, you know, I had to bunk with a room full of people with no privacy. And uh, it was hard every day. And we were grinding out on the desert every day. And it was brutal. And it was awful. Uh, Later on in my career, uh, by the time I was a pilot, the officer eh, had my own room. So, you know, I'd own quarters and uh, had a few more perks and, you know, got to drink at the bar and stuff like that. I mean, so so there were times later in, in the career when I felt pretty cushy, to be honest, compared, you know, to the earlier parts. But the earlier parts were just rough, just just rough and tough and brutal. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm so grateful you came on and we're here at the end, Randy. What are you next year to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, we're thinking real big uh, about what we want to do with this course. And there's a, a whole future set of projects that we have planned that is really about expanding reach and accessibility to people and getting reaching more and more and more and more and more people. So I'm not going to give away what all our ideas are, but w- we plan to do this on a, on a large scale as we move forward and reaching lots of people. So my goal here, our goal is to make meditation and self-mastery and development accessible to as many people as possible, everybody if possible, so. Beautiful. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.
I've really oh, enjoyed this. Let me throw, can I throw one more thing at you? Absolutely. I'm going to throw you a coupon code. So anybody who's watching your show, mm -hmm. uh, if they want to go to our website and sign up for a class, they can get like 15% off on a tuition. So let's call it uh, Space Deb. We'll call it Space Deb. I'll make a coupon code called Space Deb since you got a little space back there. And then anyone who's uh, listening, you can post that or whatever for people and then they can get a coupon code to get a break. That is so it. generous, beautiful. So folks, if you're interested in his online university, in these courses, go to universityofconsciousevolution.com. You wanna use Space Deb, as in Debbie, Space D-E-B for your 15% off. And I end today's show with this quote from Demi Lovato. I believe in aliens. I think it would be way too selfish of us as mankind to believe we are the only life forms in the universe. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you're listening on a podcast and you want to see us, please go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and check us out there. Next week on the show, Vitaka Kulhoff is coming to us her fourth, fifth, sixth time, something like that on the show. She channels Arjun of the Yael. And we're gonna be discussing global news and learning from Arjun about his planet, his role and his relationships with his people. I promise you as always through Vidika and Arjun, it's lots of wisdom. Thank you so much for joining us today on the show. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to make all your psionic dreams come true.